My name is Clara, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. It's a huge honor to be kicking off today's event, and uh, there's a little pressure, too, after all. Today is about big questions, and I was a little worried my idea wasn't big enough. You know, it's not like I needed something gargantuan, enormous, gigantic, but I didn't want to be the one bringing the puny run to the party. Um, because as everyone knows, size does matter when it comes to ideas. So here I am, and here is my idea. How do you solve youth unemployment in low-income communities? That's a big question if I ever saw one. After all, it's hugely important, really challenging, and it's only going to get bigger and more pressing as the years and decades go by. This is a big, big question. Now, Whitney Houston and other scholars of notable repute think that children are the future. Remember that? Now, this question asks us, what happens when those children reach young adulthood with few skills, fewer resources, and frankly, very bleak prospects for ever providing sustainable livelihoods for themselves and their families? What happens if these young people live in sprawling slums in mushrooming cities with no social safety net and no sense of hope? What kind of future is Whitney singing about then? Now, unemployment has been on our minds in the news for the last year and a half here in the United States. I think we're all very familiar with the ravages of the Great Recession. Um, actually, everyone except for uh, Christian Louboutin, maker of luxury women's shoes, I actually read yesterday in Vanity Fair that he thought the credit crunch was a new kind of gym. So, you know, <laughs> it goes to show um, not everybody, but most of us have heard the dire prognoses of a jobless recovery. A new jobless era of highly elevated unemployment for the next eight years to come. We are now sitting in a hole, 10 million jobs deep. That's how many jobs we would need to recover to get back to the golden days of 5% unemployment. And even if we wanted to stay exactly where we are right now, we would need to, to create 1.5 million new jobs every year just to keep pace with the young, new job seekers entering the market. People like you, actually. So it's a very grim picture. These, as usual, young people are keeping policymakers up at night. But this time it's because last month, the youth unemployment rate, that is young people aged 16 to 29, reached 15.2%. That's the highest it's been since 1948. I'm sure you've all also heard of Yale economist Lisa Kahn's research, which shows that a whole generation, this generation, is in for permanently reduced earning capacity and life chances thanks to this recession. So sorry to be a downer in the morning, but it's, it's a grim picture. But youth unemployment is not confined to the United States. This is a global issue. So let's just zoom out for a second. Um, it turns out that we are part of the largest youth cohort in human history. Can you believe that? The World Bank says that 1.2 billion young people are now transitioning into the workforce, and 90% of them are in developing countries. The youth unemployment rate in sub-Saharan African countries is 20 to 25%, and much higher for the poorest of the poor. Street youth in slums. Even before the Great Recession, youth made up 40% of the global unemployed, 20% of the world's working poor, and the ILO estimated that Developing countries would need to come up with somehow a billion jobs in the next decade, again, just to keep pace with the new young job seekers. So it's, it's a tough picture out there. Um, here's another, oops, I'm just going to go here instead. Here is another potentially overwhelming fun fact. We are also in the middle of the largest mass migration in human history. 1.3 million people move to the world's cities every week. Most of them end up in slums. Already one-sixth of humanity lives in slums, and they'll be joined by two billion more people in these squalid, crowded, essentially entirely informal shanty towns. And most of them will be youth. So what does all this mean? I've been throwing a lot of data at you. I think it means that we've got a huge group of young people hitting the workforce, trying to integrate into society. We've got this stampede into the cities, this huge urbanization. 
and we've got pervasive unemployment. To me, that means we've got a lost generation of street youth eking out livings on the margins of society. And you know, it's no wonder that world leaders from Yemen to Scotland, USA to Nigeria, are warning of a ticking time bomb. I think the lost generation is a social justice issue, an economic issue, and a national security issue. It's social justice because young people who can't find jobs are pushed into the informal economy where they're vulnerable to exploitation. It is an economic problem because, frankly, it costs a lot to control, contain, and clean up after a, a generation of displaced, marginalized street youth. And frankly, it costs a lot in terms of potential, too. The ILO estimates that if you could cut youth unemployment in sub-Saharan Africa in half, you would boost these economies' GDPs by 12 to 19 percent, which is not insubstantial. Lastly, it's a national security issue because, frankly, displaced, marginalized, desperate young people are prime candidates for recruiters from criminal organizations everywhere from street gangs to terrorist cells. So this is, again, a big question. And it's true that young people you know, are desperate and can be dangerous and are a big problem for us, but I actually think they have to be part of the solution. Frankly, um, from my work at Youth Bank, I have seen that young people, street youth, slum kids, are enormously resourceful, committed, ambitious, when it comes, if they're actually given an, an opportunity to escape the corrosive misery of life on the mean streets. If you wanted to say, transform the stagnant economy of a low income community, you could find no better partners, collaborators, and change agents. And that's where Youth Bank comes in. Youth Bank is my team's attempt to answer the big question, but also, you know, if you were to break it down, these three questions. Can we create more and more decent jobs for youth? So frankly, if existing employers cannot absorb this huge wave of young people, then we'll have to create jobs that can, because otherwise we're going to be rushing for the same piece of pie and it's going to lead to a race to the bottom. Can we employ the unemployable? Let me remind you, these are young people with no fixed address. These are young people who have been homeless, unemployed, underemployed. They're ex-drug users, ex-sex workers, ex-gang members. This is not exactly the superstar resume that lands on top of the pile. These are not youth with the resumes. Lastly, can we equip youth to lift their communities out of poverty? This is the idea that, again, we at Youth Bank cannot employ every young person out there and give them a living wage. You know, that's not sustainable, and frankly, um, you know, there aren't enough hours in my or Zashan's or anybody's day to do that. But what we can do is empower the most ambitious and driven street youth, give them the tools they need to drive private sector growth, to fuel it, and in doing so, create jobs for themselves and their communities. What we envision is a network of socially responsible youth-run enterprises that, from the grassroots level, eradicate slums and poverty. Now, let me tell you a little bit about where this kind of came from. Um, I was a college student, just like many of you, and I met a, an ex-street youth turned social worker from Nigeria. He was from the city I'd never heard of, Lagos. And he dreamt of creating a microfinance bank for street youth, a youth bank. Now, this was in the early days. It was before the microfinance revolution washed over all of us. It was, um, you know, it was before Lagos started to hit. Uh, the radar of many urban theorists who now see it as a vision for the future. Now, I've been there, and that vision is not, I think, something we should aspire to. And, you know, what we were talking about was, you know, how can we create, how can we lift these young people out of poverty? How can we uh, employ the unemployable? What I learned was that Lagos is pretty much the most extreme case study you could ever find anywhere. Um, it is where all the things I've talked about, youth unemployment, urbanization, uh, poverty, desperation, where they all collide spectacularly. It is a slum city of anywhere from 15 to 20 million people. Nobody really knows. Um, 6,000 people move there every single day from all over Nigeria and all over West Africa. 42 slums blight the cityscape. 
and uh, youth make up 40% of the unemployed. Because existing employers cannot absorb all these job seekers, many of them are pushed to the informal economy. That means prostitution, that means odd jobs, gray and black market transactions, it means criminal activity, which make up 60%. These informal transactions make up 60% of all economic activity in labor. So, crazy environment. I also learned that young people in these areas um, are extraordinarily resilient. And they're very different from, say, the women you'd find in rural Bangladesh. They've been left behind, urban young people, left behind by the microfinance revolution because they're frankly too high a credit risk. Think about it for a moment. No fixed address, no guarantor, no collateral. Um, few skills. Frankly, you know, there are there's sort of limits to how much you can you can take onto your balance sheet as, an, as a microfinance institution, even if you're a nonprofit. And young people have been left behind. These are young people who are then confined to the informal sector and have no ways, no skills, no resources, no structure to create jobs to pull themselves and their communities out of poverty. So this was something we were all noodling on as a team. And we created this model. This is the youth bank incubator model. This is how it works. What we do is we take young people off the streets by working with established nonprofits. So again, ex-drug users, ex-sex workers, ex-gang members, homeless, unemployed, underemployed young people. We then do two things. We first employ them on the job. They learn business skills. They receive, for the first time, a regular living wage. They have a chance to suddenly plan, to go from a short-term mentality where you never know where your next meal is coming from to a, a point where you can start to plan for the future, to save, to budget. After six months of working in this nonprofit business, which might sound like an oxymoron, but actually isn't, um, it covers cost of training. They get six months to really make that transition and start to build their futures. And top performers are then eligible to pitch their own business ideas in the entrepreneurship phase. They pitch to a panel of established business leaders, CEOs, from, in our first case, from Nigeria. And those who make it, who have shown a good work ethic in the first section and then a viable idea in the second, are then eligible to receive a loan. They kind of work on their business for, for up to 12 months. And the idea is that they go from the streets to employees, to entrepreneurs, to employers. And employers of labor and community leaders. Because the idea here, again, is the network of socially responsible youth-run businesses. What's exciting about this model is first, we take the traditional microfinance model and we add something in front of it. For those of you who are familiar with venture capital, you can imagine if, as a VC, you are able to put your entrepreneurs under the microscope for six whole months, observe how they bring in customers, observe how they budget and save, how they handle money, how they manage their team, how they, how they basically run a business. And after six months of due diligence, you're then eligible to give them a loan. They are then eligible to, give, uh, to get loans. So we incubate the entrepreneur before we incubate, incubate the enterprise. And the result is that youth move from left to right. And interesting consequence of it also, you actually end up having money instead of moving from left to right, just in and out. Also, it cycles. So the exciting thing is the nonprofit business not only serves as kind of a living lab, a living business school, but also covers the cost of training and allows you to give a living stipend. Then the loans themselves also cycle because you give the loan, but then it's paid back with interest and it replenishes your microfinance pool and allows you to invest in the next class. So that's the model we came up with and what it does and it, what it ends up doing is reduce credit risk on many levels. These are young people, the result is that you have young people with better skills, so they're more equipped to run businesses. You have young people who are more experienced as entrepreneurs, and you have young people who've, you've, who have more sustainable growth-oriented business models that allow them to employ others, create jobs, and again, lift others out of poverty. In fact, the metrics that we use are tra different from traditional nonprofits, which are more kind of what we call outcome input metrics. So how many young people come through the program, how many hours, how many dollars spent? We look at outcomes. For us, success is measured by the graduation rate from the employment phase, the re loan repayment rate in the entrepreneurship phase, 
And lastly, a metric we call strong job creation. This is the number of young people who succeed in employing five or more young people. I mean, we know here in the United States, 70% of jobs are being driven, being created by small businesses. So if there is an answer, entrepreneurship is pretty close. Again, what we've done is created an integrated model to try and address that big problem of solving youth unemployment in low-income communities. It's a bit of a Franken concept, <laughs> to be quite honest. We have basically reached across sectors and disciplines to incorporate elements of microfinance, venture capital, adult education, um, community development. And the result is this model that is a real-life business school, again, young people learning on the job, a community center, so a safe place to escape the streets, to have a living wage, to start to rebuild your life, an ethical, a social venture capital fund, so a venture capital fund that invests in young people's business ideas with this idea of a social return, that other people will be lifted out of poverty, and an ethical and dynamic marketplace. Ultimately, you could imagine a series of youth bank branded businesses that are acknowledged for both their investment in the community, and their, um, as well as their financial bottom line. So picture time. I'm just going to finish by showing you some of the images from our first center in the Surulara district of Lagos. This is a slum area. And young people have come uh, to our program. We actually had 50 people apply for our, eight, our first eight spots in the Surulara program, which is a pilot. We just wanted to show proof of concept, but we ended up having selection rates that were close to an Ivy League university. So what we want to do now is really scale our operations and deepen our impact so we can reach more young people. The demand is clear. Um, again, in the first phase, we're delivering business skills, technical skills, and life skills. These are some pictures that the young people took. Um, the, the core business, the nonprofit business in our very first center, was a photo studio. It just so happens that Suralera is also the seat of Nollywood which, yes, is exactly what it sounds like. It's the Nigerian version of Hollywood and Bollywood. But, um, my favorite is that picture up there. I feel like it's a picture right out of Nigerian Vogue. But these are our values. Entrepreneurship, imagination, and most of all, community. This idea that you pay it forward and you're creating jobs for others, investing in others, hiring others. So where does that leave us? We started with a big question today. And while and the, the answer that we tried to put together was this small business incubator, this youth bank. Although we developed the model for the slums of Lagos, for the street youth of Lagos, we feel strongly, and other people from around the world have contacted us with the same belief, that this model can be applied from, you know, from Lagos to, say, D.C., to Detroit, New Orleans, New York, wherever young people need jobs, which is pretty much everywhere. So I've asked you a lot of questions today. I have to admit, I actually smuggled in a lot of big questions under the umbrella of the big, big question at the beginning. But I think the last three are probably the most important. One, does this resonate with you? Two, are you a youth banker? And three, uh, what are you going to do about it? Thanks a lot for your time.